we go. Yep, it's April the 1st in the year of our Lord 2024, which means yesterday we celebrated Easter. But that doesn't mean that the Easter season is over. In fact, not only should every Sunday have an Easter theme to it, namely the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, but the Sundays after Easter are referred to as the second Sunday of Easter, the third Sunday of Easter, etc., until we meet the time of the Ascension and then Pentecost and Holy Trinity Sunday, where we then start the season of Pentecost. For the second Sunday of Easter, which is coming up at this next Sunday, the readings are not from the Old Testament. The readings for the Sundays of Easter are from the book of Acts. And this one is Acts 4, 32 to 35. The epistle is 1 John 1 till chapter 2, verse 2. And the gospel is John 20, 19 to 31. Now, the gospel is well known, for that is the appearance of Jesus to his disciples on Easter Sunday. But also part of that gospel is his appearance a week later when the apostle Thomas is present. And remember, well, Thomas said, unless I can touch him, touch his wounds, I will not believe. But when Thomas did see Jesus, that was sufficient. There's nothing in the text that says he touched Jesus. Seeing him was enough. Where he then exp exclaimed, my Lord and my God. First time an apostle referred to Jesus as God. But we're going to be taking a look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 to verse chapter 2, verse 2. Now, this is the same John who, of course, wrote the Gospel of John. But he also wrote three short letters to the church. 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. How do you find them? They are at the end of the New Testament, being the third last books of the New Testament, followed by Jude and Revelation. Who is this John? Well, he's the apostle and evangelist, often called the elder. He was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these three letters concerning Jesus Christ. So this is very important that we take a look at it. We're not sure everything about when it occurred, but most people will say it occurred around A.D. 85 to 95. And that was the same period in which the emperor Domitian began a terrible persecution of Christians throughout the Roman Empire. Places John writes about are the various churches 
all of them likely in the region known as Asia Minor. In 1 John, he tells us of God's love. In 2 John, he reminds us that everyone who continues in the teachings of Christ and believes in Jesus also has the Father and the Son with him. And in 3 John, God's love is reflected in the love of John for a friend and in John's eagerness to tell everyone about Jesus. So without further ado, we begin verse 1 of 1 John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Now, notice very clearly that these are really important words. John is saying that his message doesn't come from his own words, but from what he has heard, what he had seen with his eyes. Now, what's he talking about? He's talking about, of course, the miracles of Jesus Christ. When Jesus first did those miracles, they were not recognized by the apostles as him being God. The one that always gets me is when he's in the middle of a storm on the Sea of Galilee. He stands up in the boat and says, Peace be still. And the storm goes away. Now, nowhere in the Old Testament was such a thing ever happening, such as the crossing of the Red Sea or the Jer Jordan, except by the power of God. Now, sure, Moses put his rod over the Red Sea, but that was in obedience to a commandment of God to do so. So it was God who was the one who really did that. God did everything. Why the disciples couldn't figure out Jesus was God, but he says, but they say uh, when he calmed the sea, who is this man as to what he has done? This is very important that we also get people to come to the Lord Jesus Christ, not by giving them any evidence, for there is none, but simply by having them hear what the disciples have said and to help them to see what the eyes of the disciples said. And touched with our hands concerning the word of life could refer both to the sacrament of baptism and the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Verse 2, The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and to proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. Now, the word manifest means it was revealed to us. In other words, the words of Scripture did not come from the minds of men. It was not something that they made up. 
like every other religion in the world. Every other religion in the world comes from the minds of men. And they end up with a God that seems to be very much like they are in the way that they think. And therefore, they believe the world that you are saved by your works. In other words, the law becomes a way of salvation. But that is not what Christianity is about. The life was revealed, and it goes on, and we testify to it and to proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. When did that occur? Well, that occurred for the disciples when they came to recognize Jesus as Lord and God. And it comes to us in the waters of baptism when we are baptized into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Verse 3 again summarizes how we are saved. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. This is so important that salvation comes by hearing the word of God and coming to see what the disciples saw in the activities of Jesus while he was ha here on earth. And what was the purpose of all that? Well, verse 3 goes on. So that you too may have fellowship with us. Now, what is that fellowship? That is explained in the next part of the verse. Our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. They are writing about the word of life. And who is the word of life? God has spoken his eternal word in the visible historical person of his son, Jesus Christ. The whole substance and blessing of the gospel is found in this unique person who is both God and man. You see, the law deals with obedience to the commandments. But because of our inability to have the right motivation in following the commandments, God bestowed upon us his son, Jesus Christ. And remember the big shuns, T-I-O-N-S, his incarnation, his crucifixion, his resurrection, and his exaltation back into heaven to be at the right hand of God. It is this man through whom we have received life. And that comes about by hearing the word, being given by the Holy Spirit, the faith necessary to believe the word. And so in Christianity, one is saved through trusting the promises of God rather than being obedient to the commandments of God. Now, those commandments, you finally do begin 
to become obedient to after you have received the gift of the Holy Spirit and you begin the sanctified life. The sanctified life is where you do follow the commandments of God. You desire to follow them because of what? Well, I would say that the world would say because of the love that you have for God. No, that's not why you follow the commandments. John says the very opposite. It is because of the love that God has for us that moves us to love God and therefore obey his commandments. Verse 5, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you. Now, what message are they talking about? Go to the Mount of Transfiguration. And not only does God the Father say, this is my beloved son, but what does he say about Jesus? He says, listen to him. That's the message of the transfiguration, to listen to Jesus. Because we proclaim to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Now, what's this talk about light and darkness? There are many metaphors that God uses in the Bible to explain the gospel of Jesus Christ. And one of them is the difference between light and darkness. Have you ever gone and visited a cave where there is no light? It's totally dark. You can't find your way around. That refers to the darkness of unbelief. But then, in verse 6, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. What's John talking about there? There are, unfortunately, even so-called pastors who preach false teaching. And they say that they are in fellowship with Jesus Christ, but they don't believe what Jesus says in the Bible. They believe instead in evolution. They believe instead in following the commandments. And that's what makes God love you. And therefore, by your following the commandments, God saves you. You are therefore saved by your own works. Verse 7 continues, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. Now, where does that notion come from? It comes from the original Passover. Israel was in bondage in Egypt. They were told to sacrifice a lamb or a goat and put its blood over the doorway. And those who believed that promise did that, and the angel of death passed over that house. 
they then went to the Red Sea. The waters opened up. They crossed into the wilderness. All of that was the work of God. So also, when the people disobeyed God, and God permitted poisonous snakes to enter into the wilderness and bite people, and they died. Then Moses was instructed to put a pole up with a bronze snake at the top of it. And all who looked at that were saved. John in John 3 talks about that so also, as Jesus was lifted up like the snake was on the pole, so also we will be saved by looking to Jesus as our Savior. That's walking in the light, the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which we believe by the power of the Holy Spirit. And when we believe that and recognize our sinful nature, verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Wow, what a gift of salvation that all of our unrighteousness, all of our sins are washed away. That was the mission of John the baptizer, to get people to recognize their sin and to have them washed away. And by looking forward to Jesus, who would come to wash away the sins by the Holy Spirit, not just by water, then the people come to faith and are saved by believing the promises of Jesus Christ. Verse 10, if we say, we have not sinned, we have made him a liar, and his word is not in us. What a statement. How many people come to church, and when they are to confess their sins, they say, well, I don't remember any sins I did this week. You are calling Jesus a liar because he died for your personal sins. And so if you don't think you've ever sinned, then the death of Jesus is in vain. Chapter two, verse one, John says, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Yes, that's the purpose of the life of sanctification, to rest in the assurance of Jesus Christ and have no need of sin. But listen to verse two. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Now, what is that? That's legal language. Kind of refers, we have an attorney or a lawyer with the Father. He is our defense attorney. And how does he defend us to the Father? Not by showing our good works, but by showing his good work on the cross, that he died for these people. So we have an advocate, advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, 
the righteous, the one who is holy. And verse 2 explains how is he is our advocate. He is the propitiation for our sins. What does that mean? He is the one who paid for our sins. The sacrifice lambs of the Old Testament pointed forward to Jesus as a propitiation not only for our sins, but as verse 2 continues, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is really critical. So we do not say to someone, well, if you become obedient, God will forgive your sins. No, we can tell them their sins have been forgiven because of the death of Jesus Christ. So salvation comes about not by stopping from sinning, but from beginning to believe the promises of Jesus Christ. More on this tomorrow at 9.30 on Law and Gospel. God bless you. Listen to Law & Gospel each weekday morning at 9.30 on KFUO. For a tax-deductible gift to Law & Gospel, please make your check out to Law & Gospel and mail to Law & Gospel P.O. Box 28910, St. Louis, Missouri, 63132, or call toll-free 1-877-267-1962. Views and opinions expressed on Worldwide KFUO may not represent the official position of the management or ownership of KFUO, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. If you'd like to comment on programs or topics heard on Worldwide KFUO, write us at KFUO, 1333 South Kirkwood Road, St. Louis, Missouri, 63122. You can also leave a question or comment on our comment line at 314-996-1542. We are the messenger of good news, Worldwide KFUO.